Well, welcome everybody. Thanks um, for joining us this afternoon. I don't know if you have all had the chance to uh, see the exhibition um, already, and I just wanted to maybe tell you a few things about what this is um, is what it is about. Um, the the exhibition is based on an exhibition that Harald Seemann, a Swiss curator, organized in 1969 at the Kunsthalle in Bern, in Switzerland, um, and was sort of considered one of the very first uh, museum exhibitions of conceptual art. What is interesting and sort of brings us immediately here to Detroit is that in 1969 there was quite a number of exhibitions that took place in North America and Europe um, that were looking at, um, you know, sort of summarizing or bringing together really for the first time uh, conceptual art in the institution. So apart from the exhibition uh, When Attitudes Become Form that Zeman organized, there were exhibitions in Seattle that uh, Lucy Lippard organized, Seth Sieglau was working in Amsterdam in New York, and there was also an exhibition here in Detroit that um, brought a lot of attention to the work of, of, of conceptual artists, and that exhibition was called Other Ideas and took place at the Detroit Institute of Arts and was organized by uh, Sam Wagstaff. Um, and we are lucky enough that uh, one of the persons who worked with Sam on that exhibition is here with us, which is Suzanne. And I asked Suzanne to be here on the panel to talk to us a little bit about uh, her experience in putting together that exhibition, working with Sam, and, but also thinking about what actually happens when you put art that at that point so radically questioned uh, what the status quo of art was into an institution. Um, Tim Lee, um, um, as we already heard in the introduction, is an artist working in Vancouver. And what always interested me about Tim's work is, is that he kind of very much took off from um, a mode of art making that has uh, conceptual art as its foundation, but um, then moved on to uh, incorporate a lot of other elements, um, such as um, his interest in popular culture and um, sort of a number of other historically important um, characters, personalities, or events that um, usually come together in his work either as films or photography and every once in a while also sculpture. Um, Tim is one of those artists where you would like have his name listed in an art magazine and would sort of like say artist slash and then there would be like a lot of other things behind it. He's a brilliant thinker, writer, and um, sort of like I have a kind of deep intellectual friendship with Tim too, um, just kind of nerding out about looking at exhibition catalogs from the 60s and 70s, and I think it's sort of like how he and I met many, many years ago. Um, so let me um, start by asking Suzanne to tell us a little bit about um, your experience at working uh, with Sam Wagstaff and how that exhibition came about which at that point was you know, something extremely new, extremely radical, and um, surprising, I would say. Well, as um, some of you may know, Sam was uh, only in Detroit for three years, from 1969 to 1971. And as we see now, not only because of Jens's show, but it's still a phenomenon that we talk about, although it was such a brief, brief time. Um, he came here from the Wadsworth Athenaeum in Hartford, where he did an exhibition called Black, White, and Gray, um, introducing quite a lot of people, including Tony Smith, who had been, am I right, in the primary... Primary structures. Primary structures exhibition in 66? 66. At the, at the Jewish Museum. So he had... Um, a very uh, intuitive, emotional response to work. I think that the way he approached things was, I, I don't know if this is helpful, but almost unpredictable. And he walked around with a volume of poems by Yeats and a book of sayings, if you will, by Logan Pearsall Smith, who was, um, Kind of a 19th century figure. The, was that right? The brother-in-law mm -hmm. of the brother-in-law of Bernard Berenson. Yeah. Um, so he was this combination of uh, somebody who was um, 
casual, elegant, and perhaps when you first spoke with him, you wouldn't think that he had the kind of insights and interests in new, new art. Um, putting together the exhibition, Other Ideas, was completely uh, an eye-opening experience for me because you went to all kinds of people's studios. And um, that's where I met Michael Heiser and Linda Banglis and Hans Hacke and so on. Um, I think this exhibition can't really be described as a minimalist exhibition exactly. I mean, I'm not sure what, what title you'd actually put to it. I mean, Linda, Linda's work was called A Rug, so that it took on this kind of feminist quality or this more domestic quality, which um, was surprising. And it was quite a few years earlier than her startling centerfold in <laughs> um, Art Forum of, I think, 1973 or 1974, where she um, shows herself as a, kind of a centerfold, um, nude to the waist, perhaps you all know that ad, a greased up body looking really strong and sensuous with a double dildo. And then there's another image of her um, against a car, a shiny sports car in California, and another image um, with her jeans down at her ankles looking very defiant with uh, uh, what do you call that? Uh, uh, studded, cat's eye studded sunglasses. I guess what I'm trying to say is that the uh, range of work that Sam was interested in was um, un unpredictable. Can you describe, uh, describe the experience of putting the show together? Um, <clears throat> I've read a lot about how Harald Zeman worked with the artist uh, during when attitudes become form, but I have never read anything about this particular show. And now that you say that Sam was working in a kind of unpredictable way, I'm kind of curious uh, what you mean by that and how this articulated itself. Well, I guess um, the little that I've read about the when attitudes become form exhibition is that often he really had only met the, uh, that Harold had only met the artist once. Well, I think there were artists he'd never met before. Or never met at all, who he invited to come to Switzerland, and they made things on site. On site, yeah. Uh, I think Sam was casual in that way. He completely believed in whatever he had made a commitment to. So whatever they wanted to do, I mean, particular pieces weren't necessarily chosen. Um, he did put in a piece that belonged to him, that belonged to Walter, the Walter De Maria. The museum one, piece. The museum piece, which created untold controversy. I mean, he finally, it was a swastika, um, a stainless steel swastika. I think it had a ball. It had that, a marble in it, yeah. That, that moved around. Um, so, I mean, it was this loaded image that was also this formal image and kind of mediated between a kind of political statement and a completely formal statement. And Sam included that in the exhibition, and he got so many um, questions from a certain Friends of Modern Art audience who were so outraged by the piece that. It's probably the best known piece in the exhibition. Now, I mean, I've read a little <laughs> bit more about that particular piece and his idea how that piece functioned between the, the particular sort of geometric form it had and the symbol that, that you know, it acquired? Um, there were um, pieces by Hans Hacke that I think were very difficult for people to enjoy. I think there was a water piece, a, con a condensation the, the, the piece. Condensation I have the piece. catalog right in front of me, but I, and uh, a, a piece with a fan that maybe a piece of cloth, blue, um, and I think that... Who made uh, that, do you remember? The cloth piece? I think that was Haka. Also Hans Haka. Haka. Mm -hmm. I mean, Richard Tuttle was in the show, and there were cloth pieces that were pinned to the wall um, from drawings that he had made. Um, 
I think that Sam was somebody who had this huge latitude with, with artists. I don't know if I'm answering or helping. No, no, absolutely. <clears throat> Let me just move uh, to Tim for a second. How does an artist uh, from your generation, born in like the late 70s, I guess, mid late 70s, um, form a relationship to this type of material? Right. Oh, um, well, I guess like, you know, because, uh, you know, I, I think that, you know, it's crucial to understand that conceptual art, you know, came out of this sort of tradition of continual negation, right? We sort of have to understand that, that you know, you have high modernism. If, if you're to understand modernism, is to sort of understand uh, the gradual sort of uh, process towards dematerialization. Okay? So in which case, uh, conceptual art reacted to uh, minimal and pop art and what they saw as you know, um, an art form that sort of privileged uh, visuality, even though pop and minimal art reacted against, uh, for instance, abstract expressionism, and so on and so forth. So I think when you have someone of my generation coming around, uh, you know, it doesn't even come after a post-conceptual epoch, right? Which might have came after conceptual art in the classical sense in maybe the late 60s and 70s, right? Uh, you had, were, uh, after that, maybe you had, uh, you know, neo-expressionism, right? And this return to painting. Uh, and then after that, maybe in the 90s, I just saw the 1993 show at the New Museum, uh, which sort of encompassed, you know, slacker art, uh, you know, abject art like uh, Paul McCarthy and uh, Mike Kelly, uh, and, and so on. So in which case, you know, I'm probably the generation after that. In which case, it kind of comes back to, uh, you know, and, and it becomes messy and unruly. I think that's something that we have to understand. Uh, uh, you know, after you dematerialize something, uh, what can you do? In which case, you know, anything goes. Um, so I think when when uh, when I came around, I suppose, and uh, I was trying to figure out my relationship with this sort of moment, right? Uh, I thought that it was so, sort of like uh, a history that I wanted to not so much uh, maybe react against, but relativize, right? In other words, I want to make what I saw as some of the problems I associated with that era my own. So when I think about conceptual art in the classical sense, I think of this sort of emphasis on this deadness of language, right? This uh, sort of, uh, this look of the ma mausoleum, right? And uh, how social subjects are treated as enigmatic hieroglyphs given the authority of the crypt. So in which case, you know, you have the language-based artists like Ankara, like Lawrence Weir, like Joseph Kazuth, right, who uh, were sort of non-expressive in their language, you know, very sort of uh, uh, rhetorically objective, uh, bureaucratic, right, De definitive, right? And, uh, what, and I guess thinking about that, and that's one side of it, and uh, another side of uh, construction art, which I wanted to enter in was the performative aspect. So, uh, when I think about 70s or 60s performance, you think about Bruce Nauman, uh, you think about Dan Graham, uh, Vito Acconci, uh, Martha Rossler, and so on and so forth. And, and, and even with those artists, I think that, again, uh, you see this sort of rhetorical deadness, right? And uh, that some of these actions and gestures were very sort of uh, almost as matter of fact, it, you know, it's sort of, uh, visual equivalence to, you know, these Richard Serra statements of to throw, to toss, uh, you know, to uh, hold, to, and, and, and whatever. And I guess when I think of that, um, I thought, well, you know, I want to go back to that moment as a way to enter into making art. Uh, and I think this is a subject we can return to. But, uh, and by returning to it, by sort of, uh, changing it uh, through what I saw as moments of levity, right, or humor, right, in which case that was sort of my mode of affect. So I wanted to become affectual with uh, art form that was, uh, you know, unaffected, right. Um, and, and, I, and I guess thinking about that uh, sort, of, sort of opened up something. I suppose, right? It became an entry point for me into making art because I wasn't trained as a visual artist uh, in the same way that a lot of these artists weren't, weren't trained.
Well, one of the ideas that came to my head a lot when I was working on this exhibition and looking at the work of many younger artists or artists of you know, you, our generation um, in the mid to late 30s um, or even early 40s was that um, that particular moment in the history of art, the late 60s, early 70s, was almost sort of like mythologized to an extreme degree as like the last moment when there was still the possibility for real um, revolt in some way like a real radical moment before the art market took over, before the institutionalization of all the museums really uh, uh, happened. And, and I can't help but think that there's a certain form of nostalgia that is, is embedded in a lot of the works that you also see in this exhibition, where there is a, a look back towards a, a, you know, a supposedly golden era of, of art making. Well, how would you respond to that? A, a golden era of art making in the late 60s and 70s? You know, as last moment of real radical uh, uh, potentiality in art. Well, it certainly was a time of great turmoil and revolt, wasn't it? I mean, there were people like Seth who were talking about the rights of artists and protests against the war, the Vietnam War. Weren't there riots in Paris and all over? It was a terrible time of race riots and so on. I, I don't see necessarily what Tim is saying, that some of these things were, you know, a way to, uh, maybe you weren't saying that, that somebody like Lawrence Wiener, he almost seems Talmudic to me. Um, Sorry? Talmudic, or there's Talmudic. Some, oh, I, Talmudic. Hmm? Talmudic? Talmudic, yes. Okay. That there's a kind of belief in the text, the belief in the word, almost I don't know, biblical is not that, um, that, that these works of art demanded a great deal from the, great deal from the viewer um, because there was so much there, but there was so little there. Yeah. Was he participating in other ideas, Lawrence Wiener? I don't think he was. No, I don't think he was. No. I don't think he was. He was in the Attitudes yeah, show. Yeah, yeah. Right, no. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just jumping in no, no. and not... No, 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 no that's fine. Um, well, I guess like uh, to maybe bring it about in, in a... to think about the 60s, I suppose. And I think this is a sort of a common criticism right, that could be leveled against uh, maybe conceptual art. I'm, I'm interested in that relation to how this criticism could be directed towards the these exhibitions is the idea that, you know, in this moment of great sort of historical turmoil, so we're talking about May 68, we're talking about Vietnam, right, and, uh, uh, and so on. Uh, you know, conceptual art uh, was always kind of like, you know, socially abject, right, in the sense that it had no social subjects, right. It was primarily, you know, uh, well, like, I, uh, like we understand it to be, uh, you know, challenging the viewer and the way that you put it, uh, to see something that was barely there, right, right, and um, and to think about that, and you know, and I think, uh, you know, this is something that I try to express with my work, and what I, and uh, what I mean by trying to relativize that tradition is this idea that, uh, you know, we I would understand uh, the void uh, that lies within one of Robert Morris's cubes, right as a formal void to be meant to be filled with meaning, right? To be f meant to be filled with sort of uh, social understanding, right? right? And, um, and I guess, uh, you know, uh, and thinking about this other idea show, was, was that kind of criticism? Did you hear some of that criticism? This yes, side? Yeah. yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And um, uh, how did you sort of respond? Well, to, to, to just um, give you an idea of, I, I think it's correct, of Sam as a curator, um, <clears throat> uh, he wouldn't explain anything. He would say that art needed no defense and that it was, you know, for you to participate or at least be accepting or uh, be patient um, so that this is not the other ideas show, but a couple of years later, 
he had Michael Heiser come and do an outdoor piece, maybe you know about that, on the lawn. It was, um, it was delayed several months, and it was in March, if I recall. And so it was a 35-ton drag. It was a huge piece of granite that was supposed to and did pull across the lawn. It was a newly sodded lawn at the Detroit Institute of Arts, which is a municipal, at least in part, a municipal museum. So they just had paid for the sod to get it all looking um, uh, tidy. And the way Sam described the piece to uh, the Board of Trustees is not how the piece turned out. The weather conditions were such that other things happened and it didn't dig into the earth. And you might have seen photographs of the slab and rope and dirt and mud just there as this kind of powerful inert object. Mm. Yeah. I don't remember what I'm responding to. Yeah. Well, you were talk Tim was asking you about the, the, res the response that you gave to the criticism that you, uh, that you got. Um, I think there was very little response. I don't think uh, anybody tried to justify anything at all. Um, and Sam's response, and you know, that's what we were instructed to do, was to you know, try to again engage people with the work, but not explain. Yeah, yeah. Well, <clears throat> I didn't even know about other ideas until maybe four or five years ago. I mean, I started to sort of like really dig around in the history of exhibitions and um, also in relationship to, uh, you know, being, being uh, a teacher at the curatorial practice program at Goldsmiths in London and in San Francisco at CCA and um, sort of trying to map out a history of exhibition that kind of connected particularly con to conceptual art. Um, so I, I kind of like think that what's interesting to me is like A, how work like that enters a museum that is otherwise extremely traditional or conservative. And now you're confronted with works that are in sort of almost constant transformation. You were talking about the condensation piece of Hake. You know, every day this piece is different. And there's, you know, many other pieces that don't really necessarily um, uh, sitting within the sort of traditional um, understanding of what an artwork uh, is. And so uh, the other aspect to that is um, why was it that Seemann's show was the one, or is that one that is so well um, remembered? Um, many people, for example, don't know that um, there was another exhibition taking place at the State Lake Museum just like a month before Seemann's show, um, which was called On Loose Screws. Uh, that almost included an identical list of artists than mm. when attitudes become form. And Zeman kind of took advantage of this, basically brought the people down from Amsterdam to Bern. They were already in They were already in, in, in Europe. Yeah. So uh, <clears> this <throat> seems like there's an amnesia also going on when it comes to the history of exhibitions, because you know, after having looked at other ideas, it, it was a remarkable show for, for its time. Um, it was a remarkable show for its time, and I, I guess I'm not sure about the Bern Kunsthal, but um, it was a remarkable show to have in the, as you were suggesting, in the kind of institution that the Detroit Institute of Arts is. I mean, it wasn't a modern museum. It wasn't mm -hmm. an alternative space. It wasn't a commercial gallery. It, it was a world history museum that uh, was known for its sassettas and its uh, Perugino and so on. Yeah. So, um, and then to have that follow, I don't know if it was Sam's charisma, I don't think this is really what we're talking about, but then two years later, there was the Heiser uh, project. I can't remember the date of the Robert Morris exhibition. 17. In 1970, mm -hmm. so right after that, we did this Robert Morris exhibition. Um, and similarly, he had done things like that within the uh, walls of the Wadsworth Athenaeum. Again, a kind of world history mm. museum, the first maybe public museum in this country. Mm. So that was. Yeah. Well, you know, maybe if we're talking about this idea of historical amnesia and remembrance, maybe it's also crucial to think about, you know, uh, how these exhibitions 
are sort of both documented and uh, recorded through your catalogs. So when you talk about the uh, op Lusa uh, exhibition in Amsterdam, well, I mean, I, was there a catalog or? Which one? For the Amsterdam? For the, is it Van Beren? What was yeah. the curator? Yeah, that was a catalog. Yeah. Okay, right. And, uh, Van Beren. Van Beren. Van Beren. Right. And, um, and I think with the and other. a much bigger institution. Right. But what happened was, I, I, I'm, my, my, my suspicion is simply that Wim Behren, he, he later on became the dean of an art school and kind of moved away from curating the title on Loose right. Cruise. And perhaps not in the sexy. document of seven. Right. And I think that's the way to sort of think about this, I suppose. Right. I mean, uh, the idea that, you know, and I think, uh, you know, one, thing, one of the things that I learned from participating in this exhibition is just how experimental and random, right, the, uh, the show was, right? Yeah. And this idea of experimenting in public, right, in such a uh, sort of very sort of, you know, almost <laughs> casual way, right, right uh, is sort of interesting in a lot of ways. And I think it kind of reminded me of this, like, earlier idea I had. It was like, you know, I always thought that there should have been a historical show about conceptual art called Amateur Hour. Right? Because a lot of these artists you know, were complete, uh, completely amateurish. Like they had no skills right? uh, in the sense that we understood that conceptual art was all about de-skilling. Right? So how do you sort of aestheticize that? Right? And um, um, so I, I'm not sure if you wanted to speak more about the, that. Yeah, maybe this would be another way of entering into the topic. Sorry? Well, this idea. Yeah, de-skilling and amateurization, and uh, I guess the sort of vivid randomness of Zayman's organization uh, of the show. Well, I mean, in, in a way, what I tried to do when I was working on this exhibition was very much to also look at like the way that Zayman was working on it. Now, one of the things I noticed was, for example, um, how many people are recorded in the catalog in contrast to how many people were actually in the final exhibition. There's probably about like 15% of the people didn't manage to get a work together, didn't find the money to get a train ticket. I mean, various reasons why they ultimately didn't participate. I spoke with Zeman about 10 years ago uh, in a conversation about when attitudes become formal. That interview is also in the catalog. And he never mentioned any of this chaos that sort of like must have happened. But you know, to, through talking to Lawrence Wiener or other people that participated, who, who you know, they, they told me that you know, it was a moment of complete freedom very unlike any other museum installation they had participated in till that point. I think that was true in Detroit. I mean, you know, the, the people were invited and somebody would come with a suitcase and a, a, a piece of chalk or, or, or need to find some cloth and go to a seamstress or something or, or not. Or somebody else came like uh, Dan Flavin and had very little to install, but went to the most exclusive restaurant in the city every day and ordered the finest Bordeaux. And when the bills came, I don't know, it was Send it to rather, the... rather shocking to have to turn them over to the uh, treasurer of the, of the museum. And it was my fault because I let him do it. Um, uh, but, but, this, but this kind of freedom and lack of craft um, belies the kind of deep commitment, doesn't it, um, right. uh, to, to the work and uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to the thesis that you believe in making art even though it doesn't have to be this uh, important looking permanent skilled object. I mean, there's nothing wrong with those either, but this was, uh, I think that was Sam's, Sam's, Sam's attitude. Maybe yeah. it was that, it sounds like it was Z yeah. Zayman's attitude. And but I guess this would be a good question for you, Jens. I mean, in the sense that, you know, if Zayman's sort of uh, subjectivity and curating, <coughs> excuse me, this exhibition was almost uh, amateurish in a sense. I mean, do you feel like the, uh, with your sort of, uh, as a, I guess, quotidian remake, um, do you feel like you're sort of professionalizing something that uh, was uh, almost amateurish in comparison? 
Well, it's almost that at certain moments I had to hold myself back in order to make it more amateurish. So again, this idea of maybe de-skilling. After having done so many exhibitions, you sort of like acquire a certain experience with how you deal with certain things when you make exhibitions. So here, I was working also with a team of, of assistant curators because it was you know, a very big show for us to put together with like about 80 artists. And, um, they asked me certain questions about, you know, when do we make the final decision for the piece? And I just tried to say, like, okay, let's wait, let's wait, let's keep this open, let's keep this fluid. Uh, something that I normally wouldn't have done or normally do. You have seen other of my shows. Usually they're extremely precise and very choreographed. And here I was just, like, trying to hold back a little bit. But I felt like I was doing the right thing just because I wanted it to be in the spirit of, of how uh, Zeman had started this all. But, of course, it's a completely different process because... We, all of the artists are aware of the original exhibition. They're all aware of many of the artists that were there. It's a reference point in many ways. And I think the same way that Lawrence Wiener is perhaps a reference point for Mario Garcia Torres, same one is a reference point for curators of my generation. So it's a certain, it's a similar kind of way of dealing with that history on the one hand with sort of like the art history or the curatorial history. Mm -hmm. And of course, these things are uh, very tightly connected. But you know, I I'm, I'm, I'm feel like I wanted to also be ambitious and say, okay, well, if I do a remake of any show, then why not do a show of the most, you know, celebrated, supposedly most radical show of the last 50 years? Right. right. And I guess what about some of the uh, artists you might, I mean, in your research for compiling uh, a list of artists for the show uh, and with meeting them individually? I mean, did you feel that you were conscious of the way that certain artists might have been working in this sort of trajectory or history, right? But uh, maybe by sort of professionalizing a de-skilled practice in a way. Like, is there a corollary with some of the artists there, you think? I don't, I don't, I don't think so necessarily. And I don't know, you know, but the interesting thing with the original show was again also it, when, it wasn't really only a show about conceptual art. This is sort of like often how we remember it because the majority of the works relate to that, but there was a lot of, you know, relationships to land, art, post-minimalism, you know, the body right. was something that yeah, was the very Povera, prevalent. Pavilion. Art Povera, yeah. you know, so it was a wider range and I feel like the range of artists that I included here again goes also in all these different directions. You know, it's, so there's a certain part of the exhibition I think that is extremely dealing with like new formalism, um, particularly when you go in the, in the later section. Um, and I conceived that show really with like thinking, okay, maybe this is more to do with the body, with land, with form with concept in, in these sort of like different categories that perhaps were, you know, when you paint it with broad strokes also about what's going on in, in Seyman's show. But what I'm interested in is also to understand like, what, again going back to Seyman and Wagstaff, that there's a certain fascination with like mythologizing individuals or individual sort of subjectivities that come in when these exhibitions are being made. And, I'm often asked by colleagues from Europe who are interested in the field of exhibition history, like, who do you think is the closest curator and who had worked in the U.S. to, to someone like Sema, kind of, you know, radical, maverick, out-of-the-box type of thinking. Um, and, you know, usually my answer was always says Sieglaub, even though he was, you know, having all these different roles because he was also an artist and a publisher and a writer and all of this. And then he sort of go, went on his own way. Um, Lucy Lipar was, of course, another one. But Sam Wagstaff never really came to mind. And that was, again, just because of a certain sense of amnesia, I guess. Um, but I wonder if you, having known him, would sort of consider him someone to have, you know, possibly occupied that sort of, like, position as a, you know, really key maverick curator in the U.S.? I think yes. I mean, I guess one of my uh, remarks w a few minutes ago was that he was in Detroit for such a short time, and it's still the standard. Um, uh, I, I think that uh, not to say that MoCat hasn't done wonderful things, but it's remarkable that somebody was here for 36 months and not here all that often either because he kept a place in New York and that uh, his impact was so pervasive. And certain things, I think, uh, obviously came about because of his tenure here. So there was the um, Michael Heiser piece that 
uh, actually was housed in this building. I was just asking Marsha last night if I was just dreaming this or not. The, um, the this equals that uh, gunite sculpture that was, uh, I'm not sure if it was in, around the Capitol in Lansing, but it was this important outdoor sculpture that for the time, I think it was, you know, 1980, um, the uh, government and various agencies spent nearly half a million dollars on, and then they didn't keep it uh, in repair, and it eventually got changed, and anyhow, some of the forms are still uh, being housed at the uh, kind of curatorship, if you will, of Julie Taubman and Marsha. But that happened, I'm sure, because of, of Sam. And there's a Robert Morris um, land piece that's in Grand Rapids. The, the X that's in, I think the park's name is Belmont, um, that happened, I think, about 1974. I don't know if I'm right or if that matters. But anyhow, long ago. I mean, his... Um, so you feel that there is, a, there is a legacy, even if it's small. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes to be brief, yes. I mean, I mean, it's interesting because, you know, I started to work at the Jewish Museum in November, and uh, the thing that everybody refers to in terms of what happened at the Jewish Museum was the Jewish Museum under the leadership of Alan Solomon, and particularly also with the curator Kenneth Demick Shine being there, who, you know, as you already mentioned, curated the first exhibition of minimal art at the um, Jewish Museum primary structures. And it's, it's, so it just seems like that we, so many times and so often go back to this particular period really because of all the radical changes and, and shifts in, in, in art making and also thinking about exhibitions. But uh, responding to what you were just saying, another thought came to my head. You know, why was it that there was never really such a figure like Seman in the United States? Or in North America? Maybe because uh, an American never curated Documenta. I think that might be a serviceable answer. Uh, I mean, when I think about that era in the epoch, I might think of someone like Lucy Lepard, um, and particularly her uh, exhibition, Six Years, and the book. And uh, she organized two shows, uh, the 500 and 900,000 show that traveled from the Seattle Art Museum to the Vancouver Art Gallery. Um, uh, but yeah, I guess. That and Vancouver is an interesting place. I'm glad you mentioned that, because it seems like to, to have its kind of very own particular strand of, of the continuation of conceptual right. art. Well, you know, it, it, when you think about Vancouver art, you obviously think about maybe photography, and you think about lit photography, you think about large photography, and maybe uh, uh, large form of photography, and you also think about landscape, right? So uh, that's, I think, uh, and I think a lot of that work actually came, well, what Jeff Wall might describe as a counter tradition to art. A right? what? A counter tradition, right? Counter? Counter tradition, right? So that you had this one trajectory, right, that, uh, that uh, you know, might have been inaugurated by Zeman, right? Uh, and the other one, right, which is dematerialization. And the other one, which is picture making, right? So you have the dematerialization, which was a move away from depiction, right? And Jeff Wall and Ian Wallace went the other way, right? They went to, uh, you know, aspects of the pastoral, right? In which case they made photographs that dealt with still life portraiture and landscape, right? And not just that, uh, but it's also, I think, and I think this is a quirk to that history is that, you know, another exhibition um, that was organized as a contemporary of Win Attitudes and uh, the Lisa Lepard and the Opelousa show is um, information at the Museum of Modern Art that Kiniston McShine curated in 1970. And, uh, and that was Jeff Wall's first museum show uh, that he participated in, in the group show. And it was uh, a work uh, called Landscape Manual, right, which was almost conceptual in the sense that it was a magazine piece. And not just a magazine piece, but filled with both image and text. But these images were 35 millimeter drive-by sort of photos of the landscape, right, uh, filled with this sort of, uh, a button next to the sort of mallarmé uh script, right? Sort of like symbolist poetry, right? Uh, so if you look at that work in relation to the Jeff Wall that we know now, right? You know, there's obviously a huge rupture there, right? So it's almost like 
he consciously wanted to react against a tradition that he sort of entered into with picture making, right? By, uh, you know, by moving away from photos as document, right, to photos as pictures, right? And not just as pictures, but pictures akin to painting, right? right? And uh, so this idea of reacting against conceptual art that in turn reacted against depiction, right, was his conception of a contra-tradition, right? Um, I, I'm not sure of my place in that history, right, because uh, even though I come from Vancouver, right, um, I might have been schooled by sort of, you know, uh, you know, through sort of uh, maybe a, a immersive, uh, you know, just being immersed in that environment or whatever, right? I'm certainly aware of it, right? I'm not sure how I participated in it, right? But um, uh, uh, but uh, but Vancouver was was really uh, no, yeah. Like um, I think this awareness of conceptual art in Vancouver uh, probably isn't spoken of uh, enough in relation to how it reacted to that epoch. I suppose. Well, it's interesting to me that your work seems like very much coming out of the Vancouver uh, tradition and at the same time also staying away a little bit from it. You live there, but you practice all over the world. You live in different places and a lot of other stuff comes into your work. I was kind of interested in uh, what you said about like going to the new museum and looking at the exhibition that, that they have up there right now, which is kind of like a look at the New York art scene in 1993. And a lot of those issues that sort of emerged from um, that period, particularly the 1993 Whitney Biennial, I think seem to like also be presented within your um, work as well, even though it's not necessarily a connection that you would immediately make when you think about you know, cultural or national identity, for example, uh, right. which I think is a really big element in your work that I haven't seen being addressed in the work of other Vancouver artists. Maybe Stan Douglas to a certain extent, but not even there really. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, uh, uh, well, actually, I'm not sure. I think Ken Lum certainly does. I mean, a lot of his work participates in this sort of multilingual, right, Franca? And I, and I guess, I mean, this is another thing that I thought was important, and I think a forward criticism that you've done in your, in this presentation of this show, of the original, is uh, the idea that, you know, the show is uh, surely international in scope, right? And also more hetero, sort of, hetero uh, genus in the sense that it includes more women, right? And uh, different ethnicities and nationalities, right? Yeah. And, uh, but it's like something that we, like, I guess, just sort of took for granted as right. we grew up in a different time. And, um, and I think, you know, one, one of the things I treasure most about being an artist is meeting other artists. I think I became an artist just because I was fascinated by other artists uh, and hence made work about that. But, you know, when, when I meet a lot of people who are sort of of my generation, my age, and uh, and you know, and they're from elsewhere. They're, they're from completely different places. They're from, uh, you know, Tehran. They're from Tokyo. They're from, uh, you know, Sao Paulo, right? And uh, or like Puerto Rico. And you know, and we have this sort of, you know, shared language, right? And I think the idea that like, uh, you know, this legacy of conceptual art was this sort of lingua franca for an international sort of uh, art audience, I think, was, it's, re it's really its sort of true legacy, right? And the one that I've certainly sort of uh, noticed, right? And I think in this relationship between uh, yourself and, and myself, Jens, right? The, the idea that we both come from two different sort of points of the world, right? Uh, yet we have this sort of, uh, you know, shared sort of uh, language. And I think we share this, especially amongst a lot of our contemporaries, like in terms of writers and artists and curators, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, um, I guess, do you think that that's a, like how, how does that rank in terms of the, the legacy? Well, I think yeah. one of the things that were really important to me with this exhibition was really to make it international, make it global, because I think, you know, the globalization of the art world really has been the biggest shift, I think, um, over the last, you know, 15, 20 years. And um, when you look at Seyman's show, it was, you know, extremely astonishing that there were barely any artists that came out of out from outside the Western context, not even Eastern Europe, really. Um, 
I'm not 100% sure like how far there is a sort of yeah this sort of common language. I think it exists to a certain degree, but at the same time I also feel like that when I look at the work of a, a Brazilian artist, I see a different trajectory in you know coming into this sort of more western dominated tradition of, of conceptual art, and I think that's what I wanted to show with this exhibition as well. I think there was a wonderful exhibition that sort of like tried to do this even more specifically at the Walker Art Center when latitudes become form, looking at sort of what are historical um, or the, 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 the legacies of like historical conceptual positions in countries outside the Western world. Well, uh, as a last question maybe to you, and you could maybe just speculate a little bit on this. Um, it seems like now that we started to do shows about shows, that this sort of like becoming almost like a trend in doing so. And um, what would you think about a remake of uh, other ideas? A remake, a sequel, uh, a riff, a uh, spin-off. More, more other ideas. <laughs> the but same ideas. Yeah, more <laughs> other ideas. I think it might be a wonderful thing to do. Yeah. Um, I think it was a very special show, not only for Detroit, but in the context of what was happening across the museum world, don't you? I mean, at that particular moment. Um, I think it's something to right. think about. Well, this is interesting. No, not, now I'm going to the, new, uh, to the Jewish Museum and uh, the, the first show that I'm really curating there, even though I have to take care of a lot of other stuff, is uh, uh, the other primary structures, which is kind of going back to that, looking at artists that worked in the same period that primary is it, structures were made. Is the, the, this is Kinniston's show? Yeah. Uh -huh. But I'm trying to do the other primary structures, which means, again, artists from non-Western context, because in his show was only British and, and, and North American. But how many shows can we do like this? Or is there a moment to actually go back to like a moment that was uniquely radical, such as other ideas or when attitudes become form? And where is that? I know it's a difficult question. I don't know what to say. <laughs> well, I mean, when I think of uh, redoing something, I think of the remake. And when I think of the remake, I think of Hollywood, right? And I think we understand that when Hollywood remakes a movie, it's not for artistic reasons, but for commercial ones, right? So uh, I guess <laughs> uh, just by saying that, uh, I'm not sure if that could be the first introduction of criticism for secondary structures. Well, no, I think that, 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 that like, like these remake shows are more again like t dealing with the you know the amnesia in terms of the history of exhibitions, and then of course also with the fact that I personally am an exhibition maker. So I'm not going to write a, a thesis about it. I'm not going to go on a lecture tour about it. What I want to do is like experiences and deal with this in the format of an exhibition. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so I think maybe it's time to open up and ask all of you to ask a lot of questions. Yeah. No, I mean, you're going to ask us questions and we try to give answers and maybe then eventually we will ask you questions too. <coughs> what? changed the way we looked at ourselves. It, it changed the way we, we looked at ourselves and it, it changed, pardon? Yeah, the question was uh, again about the legacy of Sam Wagstaff's time here and the influence um, his presence had here on Detroit. I think that uh, what we're referring to what uh, is, is that uh, the Detroit Institute of Arts, like so many other museums, you know, was seen a bit as the temple on the hill, and that uh, living, working artists here were, I, I, they were welcome to come and look at the, at, at the galleries, but they, they weren't invited to have a dialogue with the, uh, with the curators there, and Sam made every effort and he was totally interested in what was going on, um, essentially, you know, right under his nose, and I think uh, made every effort to really create a bridge between the artists who were working here and uh, the museum. So they were comfortable writing him letters, coming and having conversations, and like uh, this particular other ideas show, 
Um, he included several artists from this area, and he took people, I mean, I guess like everybody, if you have a favorite, you have a favorite, but he, he took people from here with him and introduced them you know, to a, to a larger world. So um, there were people who met dealers in New York and museum curators at the Guggenheim. And uh, he was interested in artists. He also was somebody who um, had gone to the Institute, uh, is it called the, what is it called all of a sudden? I can't remember it, NYU. The Institute of Fine Arts. Institute of Fine Arts and studied Renaissance paintings oh, yeah. with Richard Offner. So he had some kind of really serious scholarly background and very much believed in connoisseurship. Yeah. On the other hand, he was uh, uh, he, w he was interested in dialogue with artists. Pardon? The idea of revolt. The idea of revolt was important. That he left here. That he left Detroit. Revolt. Like, like we're talking about this exhibition and this, this movement is something that was a revolution and was about revolt and I think he left that legacy here. I, I guess I was being more literal about your, if, if that's the reason that he left here. Uh, no, he well, left. Well, yes, I, I see. Thank you. Yes, please. <clears throat> I don't have a question. Would you allow me to answer your question a little more down to earth? Of course. Well, I just want to say, I, I want to say two things, I, and just shut me down if it goes on for too long. Right. I think the reason that no one knows okay, of Sam in the <laughs> outer world is, one, he wasn't a linear thinker. What Suzanne was saying is that he was an all-encompassing kind of thinker. So including his involvement with conceptual art or anything that sort of drew him in and truly I think he was a genius, and my only credibility for, I taught at Harvard for 15 years, I met a lot of people who were brilliant, and never, ever in my entire life at Suzanne and Jada Sam, I'm sure, met someone like Sam. When I moved to New York, we went to museums together. Our friendship was very quiet. Um, I wish I'd written it down. I thought we'd always go to museums together. It was like being with a kind of God, his revelations would give me more than ideas. It was, and he connect all these different kinds of art. I mean, one minute we're looking at the Northern Renaissance, the next minute we're talking about Tony Smith and someone else and someone I've never heard of. When he lived here and all the artists hung out at his place, there were Tiepolos on the floor leaning against the walls and Agnes Martin and other things, and Gordy, and stuff of Michael, and every now and then even something. I mean, he was just present with us. I'm going to dare to say that he was just sick of the trustees. He was sick of having to argue with people who had no clue about what he was talking about. At the time of Michael Heiser's show, there were hundreds of interactions with the city street department because of the weight of the piece traveling through the street. It was a nightmare. He was, I think he left the museum because he was exhausted by having to explain this stuff and also he didn't care anymore. He affected Detroit wildly, but we affected him. Sam was a suited guy who was in the closet going out to opera with Lord McCall. And I remember the day that Greg e. Murphy went and said, we can talk to this guy. And this is the story I always tell that nobody remembers. I think Ellen Phelan and Edgar and I were sitting in the museum. We said, you can't do that. That's not good manners. You can't walk down. This is a famous guy. He'll like that, Spring said. And I just, in the, cura the curatorial was downstairs from the Presby Court. He was on that floor. And he walked just down and knocked on the door, introduced himself to Sam. And that Friday night, they were at Cobb's Corner. 
His involvement with the artists of the community was total, and socially, he thought we were a lot more fun <laughs> than the guys at the museum, and that's probably one of the reasons that he left also. And then, apart from his amazing, non-traditional way of thinking, I mean, he made these extraordinary shows, but he still liked painting. You know, he wasn't, he really wasn't. I don't know of another way to say it. So, I think he would have done something extraordinary if he'd been allowed, if he hadn't decided to come out of the closet in 1970 or whenever it was, but it wasn't exactly that popular, and, or even understood. And also he inherited some money. Well, and so he didn't have to stay. And he was very interested in doing something important with the collection. So he was collecting paintings and drawings, but he decided he wanted to be innovative and he made the first collection of photography that was taken very seriously and became part of the Getty. And he lost his place in the world of creating shows for conceptual <coughs> art. I think the idea of bringing back this man's extraordinary vitality, and then there's Michael May, I mean, then there's Megan Thorpe, a whole other story. It's a wonderful idea. I don't, I'm not, I think it's a great idea. He was an amazing, brilliant man whose knowledge was kind of lost. And we got to see it. And it was the greatest group. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Nancy. It was such a yeah for you. <laughs> That's why we always say I'm yeah. Mm. Any other questions or comments? Yeah. I mean, I think interesting talking about remaking other ideas is you would have to put it in an institution like the DIA. That was part of the difference between the shows. So there's a way that Sam Wagstaff's show was not, it was tied to tradition necessarily by its proximity, whereas other ideas did not. You know, it was, it was more willing to, or perceived to be completely willing to discard the historical context. And I think maybe that served served it in the long run. Because even, you know, um, loose, unloose screws we're also talking about is also within this more traditional area. So there's I think there's a way that maybe it's maybe it's pointing to that Zeman was willing to completely discard all history and he is remembered for it because of Well, I, you know, Zeb, the, the, the point that you make that, you know, Sam worked within the context of a world history museum, I think is well taken. On the other hand, he made every effort to try to get rid of what he thought was, you know, the most disgusting aspects of that building just north of here. So he covered up the floor with cardboard and, you know, all kinds of things. I mean, he had, as Nancy told us, you know, the greatest interest and respect in, you know, all aspects of the visual arts. Um, you know, whether it was photography or, you know, the ancient world or Renaissance connoisseurship. But um, I'm not sure that it couldn't exist happily, you know, outside of that kind of uh, historical uh, institution. But I, I take your point. What you were just <clears throat> saying about um, you know, your memories of Sam and, and it sort of like sounds very familiar to when I talk to uh, people, for example, about the career of Walter Hobbs, um, someone who, again, like a maverick curator in a similar period, uh, just constantly struggling with uh, the conditions of, of uh, having to become an institutional curator and not really, you know, being able to live in that world. Um, when, you know, the Museum of uh, Contemporary Art in Los Angeles was opened, uh, they brought in Pontus Hulten, who is sort of like another of these like, very iconic European curators. And he basically lasted about 18 months and had to go back to Europe because, again, of the similar sort of situation. So mm. what I'm saying is that, I guess, there's a, a dignity to the museum system in, in the United States, perhaps, that hasn't really allowed for this like, very free thinking 
more creative or independently minded curating that uh, was able to exist in Europe. Where of course the funding structures were very different and uh, most museums at that point were still you know, basically run by uh, money that came from the city, county, the state, etc. So um, when he arrived, um, as you mentioned before we began the panel, you know, he, you know, he, he was a Hotchkiss, Yale, suited, conservative, you know, divinely handsome person, and when he left, he uh, barely changed his clothes and took a lot of drugs and had been to Woodstock, <laughs> which I think in some way actually made a huge difference about things, not just the experience of that festival. Um, but I think people thought he was going to be a certain kind of mind, and then he was able to uh, work in this kind of underground way, and suddenly you found if you were a trustee that he wasn't what you thought. And, but you were nevertheless kind of intoxicated and enthralled, and Anything else? Then I would like to thank you for coming and take another look at the show and we'll be back. <laughs>